Welcome to One Now Present Here. To the fifth session in the lecture series presented to you by the Department of Economics, School of Humanities, St. Joseph's College Autonomous. It is brought to you in collaboration with the Economics Forum and Oeconomica. Today's lecture is on macroeconomics and the Indian economy, and it will be given by the esteemed professor, Alex M. Thomas. He is a professor at the Azil Premji University, and he's well respected within the academic circles. I would now like to invite Ms. Shraddha Bejoy, the president of the Economics Forum, to welcome the gathering. On behalf of the management of St. Joseph's College and the Department of Economics, I'm honored to welcome our guest speaker of the day, Mr. Alex Thomas, who teaches economics at the Azim Premji University, Bangalore. We are delighted to have you today amongst us, sir. I would also like to welcome all the students and faculty members who have joined us today from all over the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I request Professor Nikhil Jha, the PG coordinator, to address the gathering and introduce our guest speaker of today. Greetings, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Alex M. Thomas. Professor Alex uh, teaches economics at Azim Premji University, Bangalore, and he studied at, at the universities of Madras, Hyderabad, and Sydney. And he's published widely in, in many journals, including Economic and Political Weekly, European Journal of History of Economic Thought, History of Economic Ideas, to name a few. And uh, he co-edited a book on pluralistic economy and its history with uh, Ajit Sinha and his textbook, Macroeconomics and Introduction, was recently published this year. And he's currently writing a textbook on the history of economic thought. Professor Alex has uh, given lectures at many uh, illustrious places, and he recently he delivered the 14th uh, Dr. M. V. Korean lecture at Union Christian College, Oliva, on Adam Smith and his contemporary relevance. And uh, he's also delivered lectures on a memorial lecture at St. Bachmar's College on history of economic thought, rigorous and relevant in 2021. And uh, as uh, the famous intellectual Lord Acton said, history is merely a list of surprises. It can only prepare us to be surprised yet again. So without further ado, I welcome Professor Alex Thomas and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and a warm welcome to you. Ms. Before the lecture begins, I would like to ask all the participants to make sure that mics and cameras remain switched off. Any queries and questions will be taken up at the end of the lecture. In the meantime, all of your questions can be put in the chat box. Thank you, sir, and you may go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that uh, very warm uh, welcome. And I've been uh, to St. Joseph's uh, already a couple of times uh, before the corona hit. And so, I mean, the experience is not going to be the same, but I still uh, re recall some of the memories that I had uh, from at least the two times that I was there. So let me just try to take you through what I have uh, in terms of the slides. So I'm going to be talking about macroeconomics and the Indian economy. So I just want to start off by asking um, what I think are essential questions uh, when we want to understand the Indian economy itself. So macroeconomics can be understood as a study of economy as a whole, whereas microeconomics is generally understood as a study of individual units. And when I'm talking about study of economy as a whole, I'm talking about concepts like aggregate output, aggregate consumption, aggregate investment. We also talk about aggregate employment and aggregate price level. When we look at the textbooks that introduce us to macroeconomics, usually we begin with Keynes and we also talk about classical economics, which is essentially referring to the economics that existed before Keynes was writing. 
Uh, and this classical economics really does not refer to the economics of Adam Smith, David Ricardo, or Karl Marx. But in any case, we essentially uh, talk about Keynes's ideas in textbooks. And here I must also mention that although we are introduced to Keynes, it is often John Hicks and his interpretation of Keynes that we study in textbooks. So then the question, I mean, I would like to ask, and I often ask is, when we look at the economists who wrote before, and I've just mentioned some people here, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, is it really the case that they did not have any kind of macroeconomic considerations? And the answer is no. They, of course, had macroeconomic considerations. And for instance, if we look at any of their works, especially um, Smith, Ricardo and Marx, it is very clear that they were engaged in understanding what determines economic growth, what determines income distribution, the role of capital accumulation, what determines employment, discussions of money. So there are considerations of this kind, but then the question is, why is it that uh, we are not taught or textbooks do not introduce us to their ideas? One can make the claim that uh, Smith, Ricardo and Marx are writing at a very different period and so therefore they don't have anything useful to offer us, but I'm going to criticize this kind of a perspective. And to do that, I have to share with you what I think or how we understand economic knowledge itself and how is, how is economic knowledge produced, disseminated, distributed and consumed. In the way in which economics is conducted, that is in terms of research, in terms of teaching, it seems to me that there is a kind of a linear view. And what do I mean by linear view? It means that whatever economics was there in Smith is, or, or, the, good, or the good parts of whatever economics was there in Smith is contained in the economics that we have today. And let me just uh, give you a kind of simple uh, way of illustrating what I'm trying to say. So the work of Ricardo is an advance over that of Smith. The work of Marx is an advance over that of Ricardo. Marshall over Marx, Walrus over Marshall, Samuelson, and the textbook that you are introduced to today, in some way is supposed to include all that is good in all these previous thinkers and remove all that is bad. And it is this kind of a linear view which seems to suggest that it is not important to read Marshall. It is not important to read Marx. It's not important to read them because we have captured all that they have to say in our textbooks. But unfortunately, ideas do not evolve in such a linear fashion. There are, there have always been, when Adam Smith is writing and when Ricardo is writing, they are disagreeing with the economics that is found in the work of J.B. Say. They're disagreeing with the utilitarian view that is found in Bentham. So ideas are not evolving in such a linear fashion and there are contending paradigms. In other words, these kinds of frameworks or theoretical frameworks cannot really be ordered in some kind of ascending or descending order because they are fundamentally different in nature. So one is the fact that there have always existed contending paradigms. There is also something to be said about the political considerations. It depends on who is in power and what kind of ideas become favorable to those in the, uh, in the ruling class. And economic ideas are particularly important because we are talking about how resources have to be distributed or redistributed. We are talking about material resources. We are talking about wealth. We are talking about employment. We are talking about wages. And there is a direct political connotation. Another way of thinking about economic knowledge, as I mentioned, is to think that economics, there is a kind of pluralism. Pluralism meaning that there are multiple paradigms that exist within economics and often they're not agreeing with each other. They're disagreeing with each other and they are contending standpoints. And just to give an illustration here, um, so Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, Piero Straffa, all of them have some kind of a similarity in their analytical approach. Whereas people like Bentham, say, what, Samuelson, Walrus, Marshall, they have a different approach. So both of them 
uh, are contending in nature, they're different in nature, and you cannot really say that the work of Samuelson is an advance over that of Marx. And so I think it's very important to keep this, uh, the way in which ideas evolve at the back of our minds. When we talk of the Indian economy, we are talking about, to use the macroeconomic uh, phrase, we are talking about India's economy as a whole. We are not talking about individual units. We are not talking about individuals in the Indian economy. Or generally, we have a macro kind of picture. But then the question becomes, what features are important? And there are so many aspects and facets within the Indian economy, so many characteristics. How do we consider or how do we choose what characteristics to highlight? And how do we decide? In fact, one can ask this question today from two kind of standpoints. One is, should care work or the work that is conducted in households, mainly by women, be included somewhat in the GDP? Should it, should it also figure in our calculation? Or on the other hand, or a different kind of perspective is, whenever production happens, there is some kind of an ecological destruction. How do we account for this within our GDP calculation. So what features are important, what characteristics to highlight, there is a choice involved. Is it the case that we look to theory, we look to economic theory, which tells us, okay, this is important or that is important. How do we decide this? Can we only look at economic theory? What about the role of experience? And even if we are talking about experience, the question to ask is whose experience? becomes important. For instance, capitalists and workers are important categories that have already been spoken about. Or in macroeconomics, sometimes we don't talk about workers and capitalists in that sense. Or the, the political implications are a bit reduced when you talk of consumers and firms. Because in a way, in macroeconomics, we are saying that consumers are as powerful as firms and vice versa. Whereas in political economy, if we talk about workers and capitalists, it is very clear that capitalists have more power over workers. Again, so the question is, whose experience do we take into account? And we must also remember at this point that when we talk of GDP or the general price level P, these are not entities or characteristics or features that we can experience directly. These are constructs that we have created because they indicate something about the Indian economy. They are indicators or they are proxy to understand something about the Indian macro economy. So we can't really experience these things uh, directly. Now moving, I want to bring the Indian economy and macroeconomic considerations together. Generally, when we, I mean, students are exposed to the Indian macroeconomy through courses on macroeconomics. Predominantly, and uh, this is my experience, I'm sure that there are exceptions to this, but most of the courses on macroeconomics seem to use American textbooks, and there's also a proliferation of uh, textbooks written by American authors. And here, very often, we fail to consider the author's own theoretical standpoint. As I mentioned earlier, there are two contending theories, at least two contending theories within or paradigms within economics. So if we choose Samuelson's textbook, Samuelson is going to promote a particular theoretical standpoint and not going to include an alternative theoretical standpoint in general. And that's been the uh, evidence. And there have also been Indian adaptations of American textbooks where the core structure remains the same, the theoretical standpoint remains the same, maybe there are some inclusion of Indian examples. So this is a way in which generally a student is exposed to the Indian macroeconomy. In other contexts, there are courses on Indian economy. Mostly they're dominated by statistical accounts or there's a wealth of information or data. Also, there is some kind of a narrative of evolution. So what happened in 1991, what happened during the planning period and so on. But the question in the case of understanding the Indian economy is what gives us the explanation? When we have all these data that we put together, is there an underlying theory behind it? And where does this come from? 
is this again coming from one of the american textbooks on macroeconomics which is probably more of mainstream macroeconomics or is there an alternative way of understanding the indian macroeconomy and let me just share this quotation here maybe it could be familiar to some of you uh, this is a quote that i've taken from karl marx in his the german ideology where he writes the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas that is the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force now the reason i put this here is only to indicate that textbooks have to be seen as uh, there is a political implication because ideas really matter and what kind of ideas are mainstream really matters for those who are in positions of power and within spaces within educational institutions like colleges and universities how do we critically engage with these mainstream ideas and therefore the question is what kind of ideas are embedded in our economic syllabus and how do we understand it so let me just take you through some aspects of my book where i try to engage with this uh, question of how to bring in macroeconomics and the indian economy and i begin by asking the question what is economics again there is a kind of linear account of even what is economics because first generally people say there was a adam smith's definition ricardo's definition marshall's definition lionel robbins's definition and samuelson's definition and the implication somehow is that the samuelson's definition is the better one of the lot so i think it's important to critically interrogate even this kind of a simple story that is being told and retold so i start Uh, by asking the question of what is economics i take the reader through a little bit of history of economics which is important and becomes significant to understand and to locate what is happening today also there are philosophical questions of as i mentioned before when we talk of the indian economy we have to make some choices what kind of aspects to highlight how do we make those choices what do we mean by explanation what is the nature of our assumptions so all these broadly can Uh, fall under what i would call the philosophy of economics it is, again there are theories of money and theories of interest rates there is a mainstream account of money and there is a non mainstream account so i try to provide uh, to the reader a contending account similarly for output and employment levels and i'll talk a little bit about these aspects in the following slides also discuss economic growth again economic growth is an import i mean all other topics are important but but all of them have immediate applications for policy whether you go and become a banker or whether you go to the reserve bank of india or whether you join the government as a policy maker or whether you are in any other consulting position how you think the economy operates how you think money is determined how do you think output is determined how do you think economic growth happens all of them have implications for the kind of work that you would be doing and more more specifically in terms of economic policy uh, the questions of unemployment and inflation they are central and i also engage with how we can uh, maybe start to think about combating them so let me start off by talking about price level and inflation when i ask the uh, the students that i generally teach what determines inflation most students generally tell me that it is an increase in quantity of money money supply increases and that is what leads to inflation but this kind of a dominant view really is because of milton friedman's work on the quantity theory of money and this is one way to understand uh, inflation but there are problems with this way of understanding inflation because this is this assumes that the economy is somehow at the full employment level and it is because of that there is a pressure for pr the price level to increase but in the actual world we are not facing full we are not anywhere close to the full employment level of output and there are better accounts of trying to understand inflation and this account uh, and i've mentioned this book here by pivetti which i also use a little bit in my book on macroeconomics this kind of an approach critics our is very different from the friedman kind of approach and draws on the work of 
pe uh, people like Marx, people like Keynes, and subsequent work where they argue that the interest rate especially or inflation has to be understood as a distributional issue as well. Is it the case that profits are increasing and wages are increasing, that's why there is an increase in price. And also, if fuel prices are increasing because OPEC decides to increase the price or something else happens in the international market, it has a cascading effect on the entire economy. So how do we account for all this? And very often it is not because of an increase in money supply as Milton Friedman thought it would be. When it comes to the theories of output and employment, and I want to highlight the fact that there are theories, and this is what I mean when I say pluralism in economics. Within marginalist approach, uh, margin, by marginalist approach, I'm talking about what is called neoclassical approach or the mainstream approach, which is what is generally communicated and taught in universities across the world. Opposed to this, there is also the Keynesian approach. What does a marginalist approach tell us? It believes in the sales law, which says that supply creates its own demand. And how does this work really? There is an implicit understanding or a theoretical kind of foundation which says that saving and investment are brought into equilibrium by variations in the rate of interest. So the rate of interest is very sensitive. And depending on whether the saving and how this relationship between saving and investment work, something like the demand and supply mechanism comes into operation. And there is also an important implication here. There is a tendency to the full employment of labor. Now, the Keynesian approach is very different. It argues that output is determined by effective demand or aggregate demand. And if you notice the second line here, the Keynesian approach argues that it is investment which determines saving. So this is very different from the marginalist approach where they argue that it is saving which determines investment. The second difference being that investment and saving are brought into equilibrium by changes in aggregate output or income. And more importantly, what the Keynesian, Keynesian approach is insight is that there is no tendency to full employment in a competitive economy. Now, one implication, let me just make one implication, one, uh, point that I would like you to think about here and then move on. So if you're only introduced to the marginalist approach, you would think that if you want to increase output in the economy, the policy thing to do would be to increase saving. Whereas if you're introduced to Keynesian approach, if you want to increase output and employment in the economy, your policy suggestion would be to increase investment. As I mentioned to you, these are contending and these are very different ways of understanding the world. And what I do in my book is also to show the limitations of the marginalist approach and why it is wrong and why I think the Keynesian approach is a better approach. Similarly, there are theories of economic growth and very often when students are exposed to growth theories uh, in college in universities and later, you're only exposed to what is called supply side growth theories. And these growth theories arise from Solo's work particularly and subsequently Romer and others where they make use of the aggregate production function, which tells us in very simple, simplistic way that if we have an increase in factors of production or supply, if you have an increase in the supply side, which could be labor particularly or A, which is represents technology, then you have economic growth. Whereas demand-led growth theories draw from a Keynesian kind of argument and argue that to have economic growth, you need to have a growth in aggregate demand. And this is an important point because let's just take the case of the aggregate production function. What it suggests is that if you have an increase in A or technology, you will have economic growth. But let's suppose that this technology leads to more output, but who who is going to buy all this increased output or where does the demand come from to buy all this increased output and where do the people get the income from? So demand-led growth theories, again, uh, this is not to say that supply constraints are not important. It just means that the causation runs from aggregate demand to output in the long run too. 
And I've just mentioned the names of some of the economists who have been associated with developing demand-led growth theories here. So now let me move and talk a little bit about uh, textbooks and pedagogy and connect it with uh, what I spoke earlier about knowledge. But in classrooms and in general, there is always some kind of attention to understand when, when we read something in the textbook, we see that, OK, there's this assumption, but you automatically think that this assumption is so unrealistic, it doesn't make sense. But the nature of knowledge production, at least within theory, is that you have to abstract. Another way that e economists produce knowledge is to compile quantitative data, which I'm calling empirical, and then put them together, run regressions, do some kind of statistical analysis, and then talk, give some economic insights. I would also like to submit another way in which knowledge is produced and generated. It is through experience. And then let me just go through some of this. And the reason for bringing in all this together is sometimes in the classrooms, a student could have an experience which is very contradictory to what is said in theory. And then how do we manage this kind of a conflict and how do we resolve it? And I think this way of trying to think of knowledge is perhaps helpful. So by definition, when we are talking about theoretical knowledge, they are very abstract and they use models. And therefore, by definition, they cannot capture all everybody's diverse experiences. They have that uh, nature of generality or abstraction to it. It is general in this sense that it is applicable if all these assumptions are um, upheld. When you talk about empirical knowledge, we talk they are also abstract. We create econometric models and different kinds of make assumptions about statistical distributions, and then we are able to say something. What I'm including in experiential knowledge is forms of ethnography. Uh, with where people go and stay in a particular field site and try to understand through experience. It could also be individual accounts and I'm mentioning cl classrooms here. It could be a, a student or a teacher's individual experience and what is called lived experience. And I think that it's important that textbooks and our pedagogy and our, our curriculum are somehow able to bring together in a meaningful way our experience, empirical issues and theoretical issues together. And I'll just make one point here, which is that sometimes students naturally ask the question of what is the point of all this theory and I want to immediately apply what I'm learning. But it doesn't work that way because theory is giving us some kind of a guide. It's, a, it's providing us with signposts and where to look and how to look. So I think that to be a well-rounded economist, it's important to recognize what theory can do and what it can't do. Similarly, what empirics or data analysis can do and cannot do, and also bring in the importance of experience into our classrooms and into our research. And here, it, I must also highlight that all textbooks and uh, all books that we read, all of them have some kind of a standpoint. And so in that sense, textbooks are not neutral accounts of what is happening. Textbooks, the authors of textbooks have a particular opinion and position on what is knowledge, how does knowledge evolve, what does macroeconomics mean, is there pluralism in economics. And so this I think and this has to be made explicit so that readers, whether it's teachers or students, we can engage with these standpoints and it is made transparent. In my book, I have tried to use literature or fiction and the reason for this is partly to highlight or to bring in experience. And I think that fiction is uh, able to bring in lived experience in a powerful manner. And let me just uh, use this quote from Adichie to highlight that stories matter. Stories have been used to disperse and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Right? And I think that stories or fiction is important because it provides a kind of experiential understanding of economic aspects. And I just want to highlight uh, two. I mean, I, I've used several kinds of uh, books in, in to make this kind of argument uh, in my macroeconomics book. Uh, but I just wanted to share a couple of them here. One is from um, 
Gift in Green by Sarah Joseph, and the other is this uh, book which compiles writings from Nagaland. So it is possible to bring in these kinds of experiences within the classroom and within uh, our understanding of economics itself, because theory cannot capture all these varied aspects. And I've just got two more slides and then I'll stop and take questions. What I've tried to do in my book uh, and to understand the Indian macro economy is to adopt what I call a history of economic thought approach where I felt that it is important for students especially to see the primary text, to get a flavor of how Smith is writing or how Marx is writing or how what Marshall is writing right? and what these authors of fiction are writing because I think that the way in which language is used itself gives a different kind of experience and I just didn't want to reduce all that to my own words. And in a way it also goes to, I mean, all, also supports my view on how libraries are important uh, because it should also be about, you should have the, there should be space or the freedom to read, the freedom of ideas and the freedom of communication. In another sense, in my book and uh, I also, take into account pluralism and I expose the reader to marginalism or the mainstream approach and also provide the political economy approach and where I show that how I think that the political economy approach is much more fruitful to understand our Indian economy and this is what is called the classical political economy tradition in the writings of Smith, Ricardo, Marx and others after them. Most textbooks give a sense that you know, there is nothing to disagree. There is nothing to really engage with in the classroom. It is almost like this is how it is and there is no scope for critical engagement. But I don't think that this is how ideas form. This is not how ideas evolve and this is not how ideas should be treated. I think ideas should be put under and put in front of critical engagement. So in order to facilitate that, I also ask certain questions and I don't give answers to them. So in conclusion, uh, Mainstream macroeconomics and which is embedded in textbooks, which is there, which comes out in newspapers or journalists when they write about it, it adopts a particular position. It does not really account for the history of the discipline or the history of economics itself. And it does not, it thinks that the work of Smith, Ricardo and Marx in some way are inferior to what we have today. So what I do in my book is then to critique this kind of a position and also to show the history of macroeconomics. And my critique of mainstream macroeconomics is of two kinds. One is I show what are the kind of conceptual limitations or logical issues with mainstream macroeconomics. And I also bring in contextual aspects because it is, it is I cannot just bring in classical political economy or political economy framework and directly apply it to the Indian economy because there are unique features of the Indian economy which I have to bear in mind and so the context becomes important and a critique also forms when I bring in political economy tradition along with the Indian economy context. So the critique is in two ways. One is a kind of conceptual critique of mainstream macroeconomics and the other one is a contextual critique in general of how we want to approach economic theory because they cannot simply be blindly applied to any context. The other point is about pluralism of ideas itself and how that leads to interesting classroom discussions and interesting ways to think about our surroundings and also research. And I also use what I call a critical pedagogy where these kinds of conflicts can be debated and discussed within the classroom and there is also space for students and teachers lived experience to come and play a role and in the process we are able to understand our economic surroundings better and also have an in-depth understanding of macroeconomic theories and the different paradigms and we also understand the limitations of some of these theories. So I'll stop here and thank you and I'll take questions. I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you very much for your talk, sir. In fact, uh, I think a lot of the first year students here would have probably found it extremely helpful. In fact, I know I found it extremely helpful. And so now that we're moving, we'll be moving on to the Q&A section. I'd last, like to ask all of the attendees over here 
to put their questions in, in the chat box if they have it already. Yes. So we have a few questions that we already took during the forms and uh, if I could just present them to you. So the first question is, is it better for an individual to save, but it is better for a nation if there aren't any savings? How do we tackle this conundrum? Huh, okay, okay. <clears throat> So the question, I mean, uh, okay, let me try to rephrase the question a little bit. For a household, uh, for a family, it is important for us to save because we have precautionary needs. We don't know what will happen. And so saving certainly is important from an individual uh, family point of view. But can we extend this idea to the entire economy as a whole? So there, there seems to be a par there is a paradox because if everyone in the economy decides to save, then there is no demand, there is no consumption. And if there is no demand in the system, there are unsold goods in the market, which means that people have to be laid off, their jobs have to go. When their jobs go, uh, people don't have incomes and then you can't save. So this kind of a paradox I mean, it's a paradox in one way, but it also communicates to us that we are structurally interdependent. Now, what might be good for an individual may not be good for the economy as a whole. And maybe let me just give another kind of analogy to think about it. Uh, when, when we want to understand how a forest works or an ecosystem works, one way to think of it is what is needed for the tree. Maybe there's a small or, or there's one tree there, but there is also an ecosystem. There is, this, I mean, by definition, the system means that you are all connected with each other. And so, so what is good for the system can be different from what is good for the individual tree. And which is why ecology, I mean, studies on ecology are people talk about complex systems because we still don't understand how these connections happen. So I think that we need to recognize that we are structurally interdependent and we need to recognize that if everyone saves, it's not necessarily good for the entire economy as a whole. Thank you, sir. The analogy was extremely great. Uh, the next question that we have is what are the best ways, books and other mythology that you would recommend for a competitive exam to do in economics as part of the syllabus? OK, so I am the wrong person uh, to ask. Um, so I, I don't know, but let me just try to take it differently and not. Uh, again, the question, I mean, I, or let me rephrase the question a little bit. One is what, what, what do you want to do after the competitive exam? Maybe you want to be a policymaker or maybe you want to enter the government. You want to be a civil servant. And there you would be you need to have a sense of how the world works. And what I've been trying to say today is that there are different accounts of how the world works. So I think that it's useful for, for you to have a kind of larger perspective, which is also of a critical nature, which is also of a humble nature, where we recognize that we don't know everything and we are not so certain about many things. So that's that. The second point is about the nature of competitive exams itself. And the question there is, who sets these questions? What kind of questions are asked? Are you satisfied with the kind of questions that are being asked? So all these open up again. I'm not giving I'm not giving you a direct answer to the question, but I'm just trying to think of how we can even understand the entire process of the competitive exams. And to have a kind of I think. Uh, uh, maybe a more critical account of what the purpose of these exams are even. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question we have is how do you extract ASI annual survey of industries uh, and firm level data? OK, so I, I must uh, admit that I don't know the answer to this question also because my own research does not involve any kind of data extraction. Uh, my own research is uh, in the history of economic thought. Uh, and all the all the data that I would have I've used in my book is also based on reports, um, one conducted by the Center for Sustainable Employment. So they have, I mean, it's them who have extracted uh, the ASI data and then I have used what they have summarized. And, but I don't have any um, knowledge about data extraction. 
So um, the next question is, what book are you currently reading? Yeah. Okay, this was uh, totally unexpected. So I'm reading this book, I'm almost at the end of it, almost finished it, uh, reading this biography, which is uh, recently published on Thorstein Veblen. Uh, Veblen is the economist who spoke about conspicuous consumption and wrote the book on the theory of the leisure class. So this is a biography of Veblen uh, written by a sociologist. And what is interesting, I mean, at least two things, I mean, let me just share a couple of things. One is how Veblen had to really struggle to find a job, to be able to write what he had to write. But the other thing is that uh, he's also, he is also, uh, he has a PhD in philosophy and then he also engages with economics and he's critical of mainstream economics and the way in which he sets that up, I, I find really interesting. And if I might suggest, it's uh, there are some kind of similarities, I would think, between Veblen's analysis and Keynes's analysis, which are, are very different from mainstream economics. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question is, what are your views regarding the Indian agriculture MSP? Uh, okay. Okay. Again, I'm not going to directly answer this question, but I'll uh, give a broad. So I, I think I, I should have mentioned this, but I didn't mention in my presentation, uh, which is that generally when we study macroeconomics, I think agriculture is not mentioned. Uh, and it's good that you asked this question because in India, if we have to study the Indian economy, I don't think that we can do anything without trying to understand agriculture. So because of the importance agriculture occupies in terms of employment, uh, livelihood. Right? So I, in macroeconomics, we have to integrate the question of um, agriculture. Now, the question of prices and minimum support prices. If you if you if you look at uh, what happens in America, for instance, the government gives a lot of subsidies to the, the people who are working in agriculture. That ensures that your price fluctuations or you are sort of hedged against price fluctuations. Right? So here, because agriculture is fundamentally uncertain in terms of, uh, we, we can't really predict the rainfall, we can't fully predict the demand. There is a lot of uncertainty and if we do not have enough capital, it means that if you don't get a minimum price, it means that um, you can't really continue uh, production. You can't really continue with harvesting. And here, let me just connect this question of minimum support price, which I think is essential, to uh, this idea of just price in Thomas Aquinas, who's writing uh, much before Smith. When, how, the question of what determines prices is also a political question in the sense that we are trying to arrange society in a way that benefits everyone. It is somewhat equitable, somewhat just. Prices is also a kind of policy tool. It's a mechanism. So how, how, is, how is it possible to come up with some kind of a configuration or an algorithm for pricing, which is somewhat fair? And this is an open question and because what might be beneficial to one group might not be beneficial to the other group. And it depends on who is in power. And let me just give us another kind of uh, simple example. As a consumer, I would like to get, let's say, tomatoes or rice for as cheap as possible. I am trying to, I mean, I would like that. But this is not a, this shows that I do not have an idea about how the economy functions. Because if my interest is only to be met, what about the producers? How will they consume? So this kind of a very narrow individualist standpoint, whether it's in the question of individual saving or whether it's as a consumer as a king kind of viewpoint, they're fundamentally problematic. And in political economy, in the work of these thinkers that I'm talking about, they recognize the fact that we are interdependent. And this is absolutely critical. And in, in fact, I would think that in macroeconomics, we talk of the multiplier because of the structural interdependence that exists. So it's it's important to recognize that we are, you know, in that sense, structurally interdependent and production and consumption are structurally interdependent. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question is, when it comes to research, public data is 
extremely important. And you being a researcher yourself, we have actually used it quite a lot of times. In India, especially, what are the challenges you had with obtaining data for research and how did you overcome them? Yeah, again, so I think this question does not really apply to me uh, because, uh, as I said, my uh, research is mostly, or not mostly, almost entirely in the history of economic thought and the classical political economy tradition. And uh, my work has been more in the realm of history and theory and not so much in the realm of collecting data. Uh, but having said that, data is it's not it's not uh, you know just out there and the question here to ask is if data is being collected one there are questions of issues of freedom or issues of privacy on the other hand if data is collected they have to be made transparent because if the government or if any other organization is collecting data from us it should be a it should be public uh, because we be, I mean, why are we collecting data? It is to improve our systems. It is to improve our surroundings. And then why should the knowledge be kept secret? I think that it has to be made transparent so that everybody can have access to it. Just like it doesn't make sense to, you know, maybe publish the budget document and keep it safe and not show it to anyone else. And I think that information that way has to be uh, transparent. Thank you, sir. We have two more questions. Um, is there any advice to undergraduate students exploring pluralism in economics? We have a book club at college uh, to explore more pluralist thoughts. We'd love some recommendations. OK, so off the top of my head, uh, this is a bit difficult, but if you email me, I will certainly think about uh, this a little more carefully and tell you. Uh, but on, on the question of pluralism in general, I think uh, there is only so much that one can do as a teacher or as a, a curriculum framer in the classroom. And here I believe for really for us to engage with ideas, clubs are extremely important and libraries too. And my way of uh, at least what I tell students here is that you, know, you should go to the library, browse and pick out whatever is interesting to you. Because what is pluralism after all? What we are saying is that how you think matters as much as how I think. And for you to then develop your own kind of perspective, it is important to pay attention to your experience and what you find interesting. And then you are able to sort of develop a kind of framework which draws on other people's work. Right? So my own suggestion would be to not take suggestion from me. Uh, right. And rather go to the library. I mean, if you're going as a group, pick out what books stand out to you and you know, engage in a discussion uh, with them. Thank you, sir. We'll keep that in mind. And the last question, uh, there are many American authors that have written books on Indian economics. Which would you suggest is the best one to uh, read? Uh, okay, this, this is also a, I mean, I, a difficult question to, uh, but if you have a list of books and then you want me to, I, because the list, is too many in one way, um, right? And it depends. So what, what are the kind of texts? Do you have any texts in mind? Then maybe I can comment. Uh, the person hasn't mentioned that, but the idea is, I guess, because there have been a lot of books in the past, especially, for example, I believe one was called The Time Bomb, which talked about back then during the Indian agricultural movement where we were on the brink of starvation, was an example which talked a lot about Indian economics, but it never painted the proper picture of what was going on exactly because it was the American perspective. So I believe the person who's asking the question is trying to get an idea, of, which is a good one to you know, try and get an outside perspective of India without much bias. Okay, no, so I mean, I can't, again, this is a very difficult question to respond at the top of my head, unless I know which text you're talking about. But the way to think about this question, uh, and it's good that you're thinking about, I mean, it's good that the question has been posed like this, because one is you can be an American economist, but have, let's say, a better kind of understanding of economics and therefore be able to capture some essential features of the Indian economy. Whereas you might be an Indian economist, but have a very traditional conservative mainstream view of economics. And therefore, you might, I mean, in a way, know Indian economy better. But still, I would not consider that analysis to be superior to an American economist one. So in a way, the question of identity is, while it's important, we also need to be a bit careful about just a black and white kind of thing. Uh, because 
what kind of approach is this author taking? Right? Are you satisfied with the theoretical approach that the author is taking or do you think there are some uh, serious limitations? Do you think that your experience of being in the Indian economy is being adequately captured or is there some other kind of aspect the author is bringing in? So this question of American author, I would say, has to be extended to all authors. Thank you, sir. And one final question that just came in is, has demonetization policy slowed down India's economic growth? Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the, let me respond to it like this. Um, by saying that, I, I, I thought that demonetization was not uh, helpful. Right. And let me give you two reasons for it. In a way, forget all the changing goalposts and all that. But in a way, the aim of demonetization was to reduce and uh, corruption or black money. But what we need to understand here is that black money is not something that is just sitting somewhere. Black money is a consequence of certain activities which do not come within regulatory purview or which are being done despite certain regulations against it. So there is a black economy itself where there is consumption, there is money transfer, there is production. And if you're only trying to target the stock of black money, which is which is outcome of these kinds of processes, you're not really addressing the issue here. You're not really addressing the structure of the problem. You're not really addressing the problem itself. Right? So it's like, I mean, this is like putting a bandaid on, you know, something if you have some kind of a deeper problem. It's not really, it's not long term. It's not structural. It doesn't change anything. So that's one. Conceptually, it is problematic because it does not understand the structure of uh, the problem. The second is, of course, the fact that the kind of hardships which fell disproportionately on people who do not have access to resources and the cost of that. Uh, and, of, and these costs, I'm not just talking about the opportunity cost in terms of time, uh, but also psychological kind of effects. Uh, what happened to informal sector? What happened to small uh, sector units? So when both these things are put together, I feel that, uh, again, it is not being thought through very carefully. And as students of economics, we need to, we cannot just be happy with, you know, what we see on the top. The, per, the reason why we think, I mean, education in some sense is not just to believe whatever is being said in paper, but really to go dig deep down and see what else is happening. What are the other factors determining in it? And how can we explain this uh, and understand this better so that we can change it for the better? <laughs> So, uh, next question that we have is there's this culture of separating person and political from economic pedagogy, a certain stress on objectivity, but can objectivity ever exist in economics? Yeah, uh, I think this is, this is an extremely important question. And to answer this, let me take recourse to the history of economic thought. Uh, when economics began, it was called political economy, and this is how you would see it in the work of Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, because they recognized that, one, they recognized interdependence. It is a social uh, endeavor, and it also means that we have to distribute resources. We have to decide how much wages should be given, what is considered fair, what is considered fair profits, how much should be taxed. And how much of those taxes should go into, let's say, public education or public infrastructure? How do we make these decisions? They cannot be decided based on any kind of formula that we have. These are, I mean, effectively, I mean, these are deeply political, deeply political in the sense that if I am sitting in Bangalore and I have a equation for some kind of ecological destruction and I say that to offset this I will create something else somewhere else it doesn't make sense because what you have lost is lost there is a particular relationship that people have with that maybe a community lake or another kind of property so these things cannot be easily reduced to monetary values and there are non-monetary incentives 
community feelings, other kinds of incentives which come in, which is also about what kind of society we want. So this kind of a separation that is often made between positive economics and normative economics, especially in microeconomics. And let me here mention this, that so far I've spoken about macroeconomics. In a way, people still recognize that macroeconomics is political because there are implications for policies, whether it's about unemployment or inflation. But I would argue that microeconomics is in fact even more political than macroeconomics. Because microeconomics is trying to tell us how commodity should be priced. How do we decide that? Microeconomics is telling us how wages should be determined. Who gets to decide that? And what kind of a framework or a conception or a worldview do we have so that we are constructing these theories? Now, supply and demand that we see in microeconomics textbooks is a construct. That's not how the, I mean, it's not necessary. We are saying this is how we want the world to behave in a way, and therefore we impose this on our surroundings. In a way, all of us are trying to better our surroundings and we are using these kinds of mental models, these constructs to say that this is better for us. But we have to be critical of them uh, because there could be some assumptions which are not very realistic. Right? So, and it, as I mentioned in my presentation too, who gets to decide? Even within economists, who gets to decide? Is it a group of economists who are sitting in America who gets to decide? Or should it not be much more decentralized? Yeah. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you very much for your patience, sir, in answering all of these questions. I'm sure they've given a great insight to all of our students here and have cured most of their doubts and queries. And uh, I'm sure everyone is able to gain some quality knowledge that they can now apply in their studies and their future endeavors. Before we proceed to the vote of thanks, I'd li like to ask all the participants, faculty and guests to switch on their cameras for a group picture. Okay, thank you very much, Shraddha. And uh, now I'd like to propose a vote of thanks. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and to acknowledge the contribution of those who have worked hard to make this event a success. I, Tirth Narang, on behalf of the Department of Economics, St. Joseph's College, and the entire fraternity of the institution, would like to extend my most sincere thanks to the almighty God for making today's event a resounding success. I would like to extend my sincere regards to our chief guest, Professor Alex M. Thomas, who spared time from his busy schedule to grace us for the occasion. Today, we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts, and this is going to take us far in the future. On behalf of, uh, of my colleagues and, us, and the association, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Clement D'Souza, Dean of the Head School of Humanities, Ms. Anita Narona, Head of the Department of Economics, Mr. Keshav Murthy, Coordinator of Economics Forum, Ms. Teresa Joy, Coordinator of Oeconomica, and all of the faculty members. Professor Tulika, Professor Nikhil, Professor Anne Francis, Professor Raiza, and Professor Padmaja. I would also like to thank the core committee members of the Economics Forum and Oeconomica. A big thank you to the volunteers who have worked behind the scenes to make sure that the event goes through efficiently. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank the audience for their interest and their enthusiasm in today's event. Thank you. Before uh, we end today's event officially, I'd like to bring to attention to all the participants that the feedback form will be posted in the chat box. We'd like that you fill out this feedback form. It'll just take around five minutes. And based on that email, you'll be receiving a certificates of participation. Our next lecture will be taking place on November 38th and the announcement for which will be posted in your class groups. Thank you all for your lively response and thank you, sir, for your informative lecture. We hope to see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those questions and uh, yeah, thank you so much.